Hi people, thanks for coming to my channel. So, um, this is kind of a follow-up, but it's a video that's, uh, that's more broad-reaching as well. A follow-up to my video on the, the violence in the Holy Land recently. Um, the latest flare-up, of course, between Israel and Palestine. Now, um, although I am interested in that conflict, uh, it's very noticeable that what happens in the Holy Land seems to get a lot more attention than arguably any other conflict in the world. Um, yeah, if we, if we look at the importance of a conflict in terms of casualties, then it's actually quite far down. Um, and that sounds almost clinical and desensitized because of course every human life is, is a life and it's, it's a very serious situation both sides um but i can't think of any other conflict where you would have celebrities denounced so fiercely for taking one side or the other um uh, as you get with the israelis and the palestinians and where it reverberates around the world in such a way um i suppose you could say there's certain other middle east conflicts like in the lead up to the iraq war and shoot anti war protests uh, and then you get localized um, situations. But I think it's interesting that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict galvanizes so many strong views from so many people. And I think perhaps the explanation for this is because it's a crossroad to three major religions. Um, therefore, its importance is sort of um, exacerbated by that. But, uh, there are other conflicts going on in the world, some of them a lot deadlier in terms of casualties. So I'm going to talk about some of them here. Um, but just a bit of background regarding my own interest. It might be because I'm from Northern Ireland, which of course um, had its own conflict, the Troubles, um, which British people know about um, and had some interest around the world. But uh, it's also just as generally I'm interested in what goes on in the world. So for basically 20 years, I have been interested in the subject of armed conflict. Um, and this is all armed conflict, really. Uh, both world wars, the American Civil War, I had a big interest in um, from the film Gettysburg. Uh, you know, my family had an interest in the Civil War for a long time, particularly me and my father. Um, the conflict in Northern Ireland, of course. Um, but, you know, when I was first interested in journalism, it was from reading biographies, uh, autobiographies of prominent frontline journalists, people like Kate Eddy, John Simpson, John Snow, um, and their experiences, are, you know, in various war zones and also places where there was political instability and, uh, and crisis. Um, it's a world that we live in, you know. It's uh, it, it's just a fact of life, and it interests me uh, so far as it is something that's happening in the world, it's shaping our world. But obviously, it can be, you know, when you over look at these things, it can be depressing. And I'm not even in a war zone. I'm in a, I'm in a stable country. I'm in a safe country, the United Kingdom. But even just looking at this stuff excessively can get depressing. So one can only imagine what it's like to be there. I've got a documentary series by the late David Frost. And one of those documentaries that's on VHS is about conflict. And he makes a point that the difference between journalists and those participating is that the journalists at least can go home at the end in most cases. Whereas um, for those involved, it, it's, it's an ongoing thing for them. Uh, they can't just switch off. They can't go home. But then, uh, you know, frontline journalists suffer similar PTSD to soldiers sometimes. Um, and it's not unheard of for journalists who've seen this sort of thing to to end up with substance abuse. Um, I've seen several films, and of course they are just films. They're not the same as the real thing, but films that influenced my interest in this stuff. Uh, one that I would quote is Welcome to Sarajevo. Um, Michael Winterbottom film. Another one is I'm saying a woodpecker outside. 
I do apologize. I wouldn't usually do this, but this guy came by yesterday. I'm taking a picture. I do apologize, but couldn't let that go. Um, like I say, this street is great for bird life, and I, I always have my camera on standby just in case. Just in woodpecker there. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, welcome to Sarajevo. Um, also, I, I know that was a really random interruption, but I just had to do it. Welcome to Sarajevo, uh, Hotel Rwanda. They were two films that had a strong impact on me. There's others as well, but those two particularly come to mind. Um, Blackbird, no, this really is a great street for bird life. Um, but actually, I'll, you know, even in war zones, people find ways to normalize life, you know, something like that, just watching birds, things that are just familiar and, um, and mundane can bring great comfort, I think. Um, things that we might take for granted in developed countries or stable countries, mundane things can be a, a great source of something refreshing in a war zone, you know. And uh, I have great admiration for people who just try to get on with life because they've no other choice. Um, but what I want to do is look at conflicts in the world today. And this is not going to be exhaustive. There's absolutely no way I can make a 20 minute video and go into huge detail about all these conflicts. So rather I'm going to um, just summarize because I think a lot of people don't realize um, that there, there's different definitions for this. You have full-scale war, in which you have very heavy casualties. You have um, a country that is basically in a state of chaos, where there is severe displacement of people, and it's affecting every part of the, the life of the country. Then you have uh, low-level insurgencies, which are often very old conflicts, go back decades, and they're at a low level. And then you have a country that's uh, in a state of Maybe uh, there's been a revolution or a coup d'etat, and it's not technically a war, but it's volatile and it could turn into a war situation. An example of this would be this year's events in Burma, Myanmar, where you had the coup d'etat and now this very bloody crackdown by the Burmese junta, um, which surely must rank as one of the world's worst, most repressive regimes. Just indiscriminate slaughter of civilians. Uh, at some point, you know, the Burmese people are going to fight back and who can blame them? Um, but then the situation in Burma is complicated by the fact that it already has pre-existing insurgencies amongst various ethnic groups, the uh, Kachin conflict in the north, uh, the Rakhine state, and of course the Rohingya situation. So Burma is one of the most complex examples uh, out there because you have not just one conflict, but several intermittent conflicts. So a good source is uh, Wikipedia is this ongoing armed conflicts. Now, Wikipedia in itself is, is not without fault. However, uh, sources there do have, that they're based on other sources. So several that come to mind is the Uppsala um, conflict program, I think it's called, uh, based in Sweden, which looks at conflicts around the world uh, and analyzes those. Another one is Project Plowshares, uh, and then there's UN uh, data, which can be flawed, of course. Um, and a huge thing with any conflict is knowing what sources you're looking at, because particularly if it's um, a conflict where the media is heavily involved, you're going to have a huge amount of bias on either side, and it will be very difficult to find a neutral source. That's why often you will see journalists on mainstream media saying, we cannot verify these reports and that's, that's the right thing to do because if they can't verify the reports they cannot say there has definitely been a massacre or this party is definitely responsible so we cannot verify the reports is um is a way of just being honest that it cannot be verified uh okay so looking at 2021 um this is as follows they update this every year and it's not an exact science, uh, you know, the figures will be subject to changes, but they divide it into three categories, major wars. This is 10,000 or more combat-related deaths in the current or past year. 
uh, to put this in context, the latest flare-up between Israel and Palestine has had uh, close to 300 deaths. Very serious situation. But when you look at the figures for the following conflicts, it puts it in context. Afghanistan, always a dangerous place. The in 2021 estimated at 10,867. That's pretty precise. Now, what are the sources for this? Um, dashboard, ACLED, retrieved 21st of July 2020. Uh, and the second source is the Washington Post. And that's talking about the Kabul school attack when an unknown group attacked the uh, girl school in Kabul recently. The Taliban denied that. 85 deaths. And that barely got noticed. But it was just the latest atrocity in Afghanistan, still 20 years after the American invasion or the American led invasion, remains a very dangerous country. The thing about Afghanistan, um, the war did not begin in 2001. Essentially, what we have in Afghanistan is the world's longest running war for one of them. It really began in 1978 with the Tsar Revolution and then the Soviet invasion uh, and then the civil war of the 90s and then the Taliban insurgency, then the American, um, or sorry, the Taliban regime, then the American-led um, invasion and as part of the war on terror. Um, you know, so this is a long, long running, running conflict over 40 years now and cumulatively up to 2 million deaths, but 10,867 just this year. That might be an exaggeration, it might be an underestimate, um, but either way, it's it's a major war still. Yemen, uh, that's really become a dismal situation. Um, the figure for this year, 7,241 deaths, almost 20,000 deaths in 2020. Of course, uh, this is another area where conflict can get complicated. What is violent deaths and what is deaths exacerbated by a conflict situation? So a lot of the deaths in Yemen may be from the famine that's going on there as opposed to violent deaths. And this was also true of the Second Congo War, the DRC, um, from 1998 to 2003. That's often cited as the deadliest conflict since World War II, and you can see figures as high as 5 million deaths. But where things get a bit grey is a lot of those deaths are from famine, malnutrition, disease, as opposed to actual violent deaths. So can that be called part of the war or not? Um, I think where it gets complicated is you have war deaths that are associated with a breakdown in national infrastructure and a country, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is extremely poor, has very poor infrastructure, um, is a massive country. Um, you know, you're going to get complicated factors. The third conflict is one I've mentioned before, and that's the Tigray War in northern Ethiopia, which has several parties involved, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, according to this source. Um, you know, this is arguably the the number one war in the world today. Uh, fatalities in 2021, 16,050 to 49,000. That's just in 2021. And there's various sources for this. Um, situation reports, uh, Bloomberg, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, this was a war that broke out in late 2020. Um, Tigray is a troubled region of Ethiopia, but the violence over the last half year has been particularly bad, and it's been widespread reports of uh, massacres. Uh, it could well be that this is the new Darfur. Um, it, by all accounts, is a very grim situation, but it doesn't get anywhere near the sort of attention that Israel and Palestine have got. Why is that? Well, um, the sad reality is the outside world might simply not be that interested. That's unfortunately the reality, because people think Horn of Africa, what's new? That's the sad reality. Um, you just don't get celebrities, for example, attacked in the same way if they support the Ethiopian government or the TPLF or the Eritrean government. There just isn't the same interest. Now, if you type in Tigray to YouTube, you will get videos. There are reports about it. Um, but as with so many war zones, there is limited access to journalists. So I wouldn't entirely blame the media. Because journalists can only report, you know, they're human beings. People need to realise um, 
if journalists are restricted by governments, it's very, very difficult to get that information as much as they try. So I, I would defend journalists in this regard. Um, I don't think it's that journalists aren't interested. I mean, as a freelancer, I'd be very interested in covering something like Pete Gray, but I know full well that there are limitations on what you can report and what you can't. That's true also of totalitarian regimes. Like the Chinese regime, for example, would limit access to outside journalists to the camps in Xinjiang. And then incidentally, then the Chinese, not Chinese nationals will say, oh, well, that's biased Western media. But how can they expect the media to to show the whole picture if they're restricted in access. It's a paradox. So anyway, those are considered to be the three major wars in the world today. Um, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Tigray. Uh, and you might say, what about Syria and Iraq? Well, the situation there is those conflicts have actually de-escalated. Um, they're not at the sort of levels of violence that they were uh, in the 2010s. Uh, but in the next category, wars between 1,000 and 10,000 fatalities. And again, this sounds very clinical because we're talking about lives, right? But this is the way it is categorized. Um, internal conflict in Myanmar, over 1,000 fatalities in 2021. But there's been a lot of focus because of the coup d'etat and because the violence has now come to the cities of Burma, whereas before the conflict was restricted to remote rural regions. Um, Gorno Karabakh, 14 deaths in 2021, yet last year it was a major war, 7,687, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And like Israel and Palestine, that's a very old conflict. You know, Armenia and Azerbaijan are long running enemies, and the Nagorno Karabakh dispute has never really been put to rest. So it's very likely this will break out again in the near future. Um, Somalia. A long-standing conflict ever since 1991. It's really a 30-year war now. Uh, 1,113 fatalities in 2021. The Aturu conflict in the DRC, 400 deaths this year. Um, and there's various insurgencies in the DRC. Also Kivu, uh, the Kivu region. Um, and there's others as well. Uh, the Katanga insurgency. Um, Syria, let's look at Syria because it was the major, major war of the 2010s, 2,284 deaths this year. That's a lot of people, but again, if we look at the 2000s where it really was um, a mini world war going on there, that's greatly de-escalated. And sadly, it looks like Assad has just got the, you know, he's, I think the world's given up on Syria, unfortunately. The Boko Haram insurgency. Three and a half thousand deaths this year uh, remains a very serious conflict, um, and that's affecting four countries: Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, and Chad. The Mexican drug war, um, three thousand deaths this year, remains very serious. Um, and of course, that's an example where that would particularly affect the United States and, to a lesser extent, Canada and all the Central American countries. So there'll be more focus on the Mexico drug war in North America than anywhere else in the world. Um, then you have conflicts that kind of span several borders. For example, the um, insurgency in the Maghreb, that's been going on since 2002. That affects Algeria, Burkina Faso, Chad, Libya, Mali, Niger, and Tunisia. Um, and it's they're all interlinked with various Islamist insurgencies. Um, the insurgency in Cabo Delgado, the rest of the region of uh, Mozambique, that's got more attention this year because of the horrendous events in Palma, the city of Palma, when Islamists beheaded people there. Um, so that's a conflict that may now start to get more attention. For one reason, there were several foreigners killed in that attack. Um, but there's new conflicts that are likely to break out. The Anglophone crisis in uh, Cameroon. In the last few days, people have been killed in that um, situation. So that's a crisis uh, between the Anglophone and the Francophone speaking part of Cameroon. It's sometimes called the Pool War or the, um, the Anglophone crisis. Um, there's various low-level conflicts that don't get major international interests but are rumbling on and have been for many years, such as the West Papua conflict 
um, in uh, Indonesia. It's technically Indonesia, but it's an uh, independence movement. It's been going since 1962. So these are long, long running conflicts. Um, another example of a war that's broken out this year is the insurgency in Northern Chad, um, which included the death of the Chadian leader, the dictator um, Idris Deby. Um, so his death brought attention to that conflict. Um, and, you know, Chad is, is one of those places that is geopolitically, it's in many ways a failed state, but it's still geopolitically important because it's right in the centre of the Sahel region. So that, that's basically a roundup of uh, conflicts in the world today. Now, on a more optimistic note, because this is grim stuff, you know, we're talking about war here. On a more optimistic note, believe it or not, there were actually more people killed in armed conflict in the 1970s than there are today. That's of no comfort if you're a refugee in Tigray. But, you know, there's a quote often attributed to Plato, whether Plato ever said it or not is another matter, but only the dead have seen the end of war. Um, it's far, far harder to get peace than it is to wage war. That's been seen in Northern Ireland and Colombia, where peace processes have taken years, and the Holy Land for that matter. Um, and when you have such massive destruction as you see in the Syria war, it will take decades to rebuild that country. Decades. Um, so, this is an interesting subject, but uh, it, it shows that peace is possible, reconciliation is possible, but uh, at the same time, you know, people have seen their whole families wiped out. It's unrealistic to expect them to just turn the other cheek. So, for me, my feeling is gratitude that I live in a country that is politically stable um, and profound sympathy for people whose lives are uprooted by this. Um, but sometimes, you know, these situations, there is not, uh, you can't get a crystal ball and say this is the answer. When you get a situation like the Syria war, or today the Tigray war, um, what is the solution? Because you get a situation where accusations are made of, for example, massacres, and then in the case of Addis Ababa, we'll just deny that. But, you know, parties that are culpable that know what they're doing or what their, their forces are doing, um, it takes a special level of desensitization to knowingly commit atrocities and lie about it to the world. Um, and I think, you know, as someone who's training to be a freelance journalist, something I will always be aware of is the need for impartiality, but also being aware that I might see some very unpleasant things. And how will I not let that get to me? It's something I often ponder on. If I do go down that route, I'm not saying that, oh, I'm going to be in a war zone next year. I, I don't know. because There's a lot of logistics to look through as a freelancer. But um, it's just part of the world we live in. And like I say, there are some conflicts that seem to be perpetual. Israel and the Palestinians, Armenia and Azerbaijan, India and Pakistan. These are ancient, or they seem to be ancient, conflicts uh they're not actually ancient in the sense of antiquity but they, they've went on for so long that's generational so anyway i'm just making this video to sort of draw awareness of this i'll put the wikipedia source um if if you're interested in any of this stuff check out the videos on the p gray war because that is a major conflict going on in the world today um but as, as we've seen in uh, Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, there's always potential for new conflicts to break out, but there's also potential for old conflicts to finally get peace. Peace can happen. And on a, I'll close on an optimistic note. Um, as terrible as these things are, there are some conflicts in the world so that were ongoing, that were brutal, that were terrible, and now there's largely peace. An example of this, is between Vietnam and the United States. Go back a few decades, uh, you know, the Vietnam War, the Second Indochina War, 
give it a more broad term, or the American War, as the Vietnamese call it, it, it was very brutal. You know, thousands killed, uh, displaced, um, a very brutal war. Yet today, Vietnam and the United States have very good relations. And Vietnam's a vibrant economy. It's fast growing. It's a totalitarian state. It's a communist country. But uh, I would argue Vietnam's come a long way since the dark days of the past. So that's an example for optimism. Uh, another example would be Angola. You know, Angola suffered a brutal civil war. Now, Luanda, capital, is one of the fastest growing uh, cities in the world, also one of the most expensive. This is not to say Angola doesn't have problems. As Princess Diana highlighted, it still has a legacy of war with all its landmines, but it's uh, seen relative peace uh, since the ceasefire in 2002. So there's always potential for optimism, but armed conflict's a terrible thing and it should be avoided as much as possible. But I also believe that um, dictatorship and tyranny is just as bad as war. And I really, really have contempt for so-called pacifists who think that the way to respond to totalitarian thugs like Bashar Assad is to do nothing. Um, that, to me, is not pacifist. No. Um, that's why I have such contempt for the likes of the Stop the War Coalition, who will constantly reel against the West. Uh, you know, they'll vilify the United States and the UK, but they'll have nothing to say about what Russia uh, is doing in that region and what Assad has done to his own people, which is one of the worst crimes, I would argue, of the 21st century. Um... And it looks like he's on course to win another election. That's a great sadness, the great tragedy of Syria, that the man who started that conflict, um, he has prevailed. and He will remain in power. You know, Syrians who've lost their families to barrel bombs because of this man, that must be a very, very bitter pill to swallow. So that's where reconciliation becomes difficult. How can you have reconciliation when there's no justice? But that's perhaps for another video. Anyway, uh, this was a longer one, but there was a lot to cover. I'll put a link to the Wikipedia article. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you live in a part of the world that is impacted by armed conflict. You also have areas like Mexico, which is an ongoing armed conflict that doesn't affect the whole country. Certain states in Mexico are safer than others. And then uh, finally, you get places where the crime rate is so high it's even worse in some war zones. For example, El Salvador, Honduras. These are countries with extremely high homicide rates. Venezuela. But they're not actually war zones. That's an interesting thing to consider. Okay, let me know your thoughts. Uh, and I'd particularly like to know, hear from people who are perhaps in a, in a war zone. What's your perspective? How do you deal with life? How do you just get on with things? Let me know your thoughts.